Senate Bill 143. Essentially, they're wanting to guarantee the bulk of the tags to guided non-resident hunters. There's a, a Senate Bill 312, and it basically abolishes the outfitter allocated draw. Welcome to the Built to Hunt podcast, brought to you by the team of hunt advisors at the Hunt and Fool magazine, where we are dedicated to helping our members go on more hunts with better information. Join Hunt and Fool today at huntandfool.com. Garth Jensen here with another Built to Hunt podcast, and on today's podcast, we're going to be looking at some of the changes, proposed changes, that could be coming down the pipe for a few few of these states. I know the legislative session is just getting kicked off, uh, lots of new bills being introduced, we're getting a lot of questions here at the office, there's a lot of chatter on social media about it. Um, so we figured, I mean, we're not the authorities by any means of this, but it it, it, it does kind of go into our wheelhouse where we cover a lot of different states and we see what other states have done in the past. And it's going to cover some of the rules and regulations that other states have adopted and other states haven't. So we'll kind of dive into it and we'll go from there and see what is, I guess, on the books or could be potentially on the books in upcoming years if some of these bills are passed. I think it's interesting, Garth, that some states create rules for hunting, about the draw, about how everything works, and they can do it at a department level or with the commission and the board. Sometimes that has to be written into law, so they have to go a little bit higher and go to the administrative code for the state. And that's why we see bills come from the legislature or from the top down, and then they'll force that on the department to change the rule or enforce it. So every state's a little bit different, but we want to keep you guys in the know of what's going on so that you can contact the representatives or keep tabs on what's going on so it's not a surprise when it shows up later. Yeah, and again, most of these, or all these bills we'll be discussing today, none of them have actually been passed. They're, not they're, even they're just They're just on yep. the floor right now. They're discussing them. Um, so they're in the pre-stages um, going forward, so we're just trying to inform people. Sure. So we've got Jared, Eric, and Robert on this podcast so we got five of us here it's pretty special our uh, in-house montana experts are going to kick off talking about senate bill 143 the new bill that's just been introduced in montana it's got a lot of buzz around it give us a brief synopsis guys what is this looking like it's it's not a huge bill but it does have quite a few drastic changes especially for non-residents all right so yeah uh montana bill 143 uh, they just had a Senate hearing on that bill here a few days ago on Tuesday. Um, basically what they're looking to do is they're looking to guarantee as written, uh, 60% of the class B10 and B11 licenses to guided non-resident hunters. Um, the B10 is, uh, a fancy, fancy name for the big game combo. And the B11 is the deer combo. So essentially, they're wanting to guarantee um, the bulk of the tags to guided non-resident hunters. And this is not like a, a special draw for them. They would just be able to obtain that for their clients before the end of March. Is that right? Correct. Yep. So those sales would, would begin on January 1st. They would run through the end of March before the... Um, the application deadline, um, any licenses that weren't sold during that time period, um, and they're calling them uh, early bird tags, that's the, the word they're using right now. Um, any of those tags that weren't sold during that time period would end up going into uh, the traditional draw. I think it's important to point out that right now, in order to get this general license as a non-resident, you have to apply by the 1st of April and there's a preference point system and you apply for that license, if you will. And then if you don't get it, then you're out for the limited draw. But this is appeals to the general licenses only. And so he's creating, he's wanting to create an outfitter sponsored program where they can get the licenses before everybody else. Is that right? Yep. That's all right. And there's no way for an outfitter to do said thing currently. 
he has to wait for his clients no. to get lucky in the draw. Is that right? That is correct. Right now, any non-resident that is trying to draw a tag has to go through the same process as a do-it-yourself or a guided client. So right now, non-residents are all applying for the draw at the same time. And like I said, there is a preference point system where 75% of these tags are given to the guys the most points, 25% go random. And then the outfitters are hoping to draw their clients in the draw. And uh, so they're trying to essentially, like Eric said, the number that they started with was 60. It sounds like they're trying to to rein that back a little bit after, you know, a little bit of the hearings and things to maybe like a 40 to 45. That was the last I heard that's been proposed. Um, but, you know, this – Montana had this, um, you know, back pre 2010, there was a outfitter sponsored license that kind of ran under the exact same program. This is, you know, they had to, you know, get them bought before the application. And, um, so this was, went on for a long time and they used to have this. And then back in 2010, the residents of Montana, or maybe non-residents, I'm not sure was all involved with it, but they got it on the ballot. And uh, so it was on the ballot in 2010, and uh, the Montana residents voted to, to get away with the outfitter tax, to do away with them. So they used to have it. They lost it 10 years ago um, when the public decided that in a vote, and then now they're trying to get them back. Um, you know, in a lot of it, you know, talking to some of them is, you know, due to COVID, they don't feel they're, you know, able to go to trade shows this year and they're struggling and, you know, they want to be guaranteed clients every year. So that's kind of the big push with the outfitters. Um, but it's, it's kind of one of those things that's super controversial. You know, as we all know, they had it, the, the public voted it out. Now they want it back. And, you know, so it's, it's definitely probably, I'd say one of the more controversial bills that I've read, you know, hunting related, uh, for this year. Now, if, now, have any of you Montana experts, have you guys, is it about 40% or what percentage of hunters actually go with an outfitter in the state of Montana on these general elk tags or general deer tags every year? Have you heard that number? There's so been a bunch of numbers thrown around. Um, 40% is one of them. I, I tend to believe that number is probably a little closer to 30%, um, maybe a little less than that. Uh, kind of depends on who you're talking to for that number. Yeah, the... So basically there was a, I got an email yesterday from an outfitter in Montana. I was asking him for any current and relevant updates. And in section eight, where the 60% was originally proposed, they have now set a cap or proposed to amend that to set a cap of 45% for the limited outfitter pool. So that's kind of the, the new number is 45. And the outfitters are arguing that historically that is the number of clients that do book with an outfitter. But to Eric's point, <clears throat> Montana's got an interesting system where, you know, they're depending on how you count who's like a fully outfitted hunt versus uh, partially outfitted, like a, AKA you're contracted under an outfitter, but it might be for uh, trespass fees or drop camps or not true fully outfitted. That's where I tend to agree with Eric too. I think the numbers lower they want to shoot for the moon they want as many of these set aside as possible right because the way it works is anything that's not consumed for outfitters in that limited outfitted pool then would go into the remaining the the drawing for the remaining diy non-residents anyway so they'd way rather have excess in that pool than to have too few but at the same token <clears throat> any any applicants that put in for that guide draw if it starts to exceed the number of permits set aside for that outfitter draw, the guide draw that they we're talking about, those applicants would then be dumped in to the regular draw to compete with do-it-yourself hunters for that spot to go with their outfitter too. That's correct. Yeah, and if like they didn't have their early bird tag bought, you know, then they would just go into the regular draw. If they didn't have time to get the paperwork through, they'd go into the early the regular draw and then be competing against, you know, the non-resident hunters. Um, one thing I did uh, hear, and I, it's not a fact by any means, but I know we all know there's a lot of tags turned back in every year. And um, from the people I've talked to in Montana and the outfitters, they said that when those tags get turned in, they're going to try to stick to the traditional list where Montana will allow people to sign up and then they'll randomize that list and people get tags. So according to those guys, the outfitters wouldn't have preference on any tags after the fact their clients would have to jump through the same hoops that a non-resident DIY guy would be trying to get. Now, uh, just when, when they go through this, the one, the one con that I did see, if you are a, a, a DIY guy, um, and this is just one of a couple of them, 
But in Montana, you have to draw that general license to be considered in the limited entry draw for your elk tag or your deer tag. Whereas if they had specific tags set aside, basically you could apply with an outfitter. Granted, you do have to pay that $100 fee, so it's going to be a little bit extra. But if you were guaranteed to get that general tag every single year and then turn around and you would be guaranteed to go into the limited draw for whatever hunt you would, you know, or p- applying for in the limited elk draw, that would give you a pretty big advantage if it got to where that there was, you know, pretty much a guaranteed draw in the outfitter pool. I mean, that's worth a hundred bucks. And especially if the, if the regular non-resident draw um, got to where you could only draw that general tag every two or three years. Now you're missing out on potential years you could have been eligible for a limited draw elk or deer tag. 100%. Absolutely. You know, one thing that I don't like in this bill as well is right now uh, non-residents can obtain up to three preference points. So let's just say a non-resident drew in 2020 and hunted and he applies in 2021, buys this point before he applies. Let's say he doesn't draw. He can buy another point in July and then next year, when he gets ready to apply again in 2022, he could buy another point. So he can truly go into the draw with three points. So he would be guaranteed a tag before anybody with two points or one points. In this SB 143, they want to take that away from three points and take it down to two points. Yeah. One thing I, I hate to see is, you know, let's say it does take three to five years for non-residents to draw these tags. Um, because let's say the outfitters do get a huge percentage. Well, those out those guys are going to be capped at two points. So I could be on the wait list at two points didn't draw. Garth drew his tag two years later. I still haven't drawn. He's caught up with me now. Me and him are equal. It's like why not allow those points to continue for however many years it takes to draw these tags? Why cap a guy at two points? It makes no sense to me. Right. Another thing I don't like about the the way the bill is currently written as well is the text in the bill is saying that the twenty five percent of combo tags that that are being awarded are, are awarded in the random portion of the draw. So they're given 25% of the tags out randomly. Um, the way the bill's written, they're guaranteeing that allocation to zero point holders. So you're on one, one point, you got no shot. Right. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and the I way it's- I read that too. Yeah, it, it looks like it's worded if you don't purchase a point in that draw, then you're eligible for the random draw. But it sounded like that the way it's worded, if you purchased a point, you were ineligible for that random. <laughs> Which makes a bunch of sense. That's, yeah, that sounds like an oversight <laughs> on uh, writing of the well, bill. The purpose was to have random tags, but that wasn't portrayed properly. Yeah, it's an unintended consequence. And honestly, you know, I had a conversation yesterday for an hour with uh, an outfitter friend of mine in Montana who's very vested in this bill, definitely wants to see it go through. And he and I are on different sides of the coin. Um, I am pro hunter period. So I'm pro DIY and pro guided. Um, But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm also pro like letting the market dictate supply and demand. And that's what I don't like about the bill primarily, but back to that issue of uh, the random tag allocation, Eric, I too saw that in the bill. And that's one of the big problems I have with all of this the language and the haste at which it has been put forward leaves a lot of holes in the solutions they're trying to provide. The biggest being the draw itself. And that's back to what you're saying, Robert. It's what you're saying too, Eric. The the problem, and I shared this with my outfit buddy, Montana has a very busted draw system to start with. And that's part of the problem with the lack of transparency for the outfitters in the first place. And, you know, we take hundreds of calls a year from confused Montana applicants trying to understand how the deer and elk draw works. Montana needs to fix that first, not try to throw this Band-Aid over the top of an open wound. I mean, are we creating an equal fair chance for these outfitters? I'm trying to think of ways an outfitter could exploit the system or mess it up. So you take an outfitter that's got 20,000 acres of private land, he can handle quite a few hunters, and he needs them to draw general licenses. But then down the street, you've got an outfitter that has a tiny little private lease, and he can apply as many hunters as he wants under him to buy up the tags, potentially taking the tags away from the big outfitter that's been there for 30 years that's got 20,000 acres. Like, is that fair? Should they have no cap on how many outfitter-sponsored licenses they can get? The, the one thing that I, that I look at in here, 
uh, that I noticed as part of this bill, um, and, and it's not a change in the bill, but just those allocation to landowners or outfitters that have leases on out or on private land. I mean, they're still taking. I mean, potentially, even if they cut this back to forty-five percent, you know, let's say that that's a more fair, fair place to go with an outfitter because that's how typically how many tags or around that portion go with an outfitter or use an outfitter at some point. But then you also tack onto that twelve percent of the overall number of tags for landowner guaranteed tags. You know that they the landowner can guarantee a sponsor uh, a non-resident to come hunt, and granted, they're not hunting in public public areas. But it still comes right out of the non-resident pool. So even if they cut that back, you're still looking at over 50% is going to go out of that general pool for DIY hunters. Right. That's messy. You know, one of the, I, I guess, it's it, to be fair to the bill, I think we ought to talk about what they're saying are the good things, right? Because mm-hmm. um, I think as, as a general rule, the majority of us on this podcast, and I'm not even positive of this, but are against the bill as currently written. But the positives that they're trying to advocate, first and foremost, is that guided hunters, a.k.a. tourists, bring more money into the state than unguided do. They claim it's a five to one ratio, that the guided client brings five times more revenue to the state than an unguided client, which... Of course, we can argue economics about that one way or the other, but that's one of their positives. Another positive is they feel like outfitters shouldn't have to play the lottery to run their business. They should be able to have some guaranteed sort of income because these outfitters are such a huge part of the Montana economy. And then finally, they're arguing that this, the extra revenue from the increased fees around this particular outfitter allocation is going to put more money into securing private land access for the DIY and guided hunters, essentially, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the current economics behind it are saying somewhere between like 2.4 and $2.8 million because they've actually increased it. It was $100 originally, Garth. But they've actually increased in the new proposal that it's going to be $200 oh, wow. extra. And they're, they argue it's going to be over $2 million and that's going to be divided into four separate categories, 25% each, half of which goes into securing private land public access. So that's the pros. And I'm going to take one of the legs out from under the pros right now, in my opinion. That's all the pros that I'm aware of, by the way. But that pro that it's going to secure more public access to private land, the problem is – that money is not earmarked and dedicated to that permanently. By the end of the year, the bill allows that money to go straight into the general license slush fund that hasn't been used to secure more block management or more private access easements. That money goes right back into the slush fund, which will keep Montana residents' fees artificially deflated for the next five plus years. But more importantly, the money's just gone. It did not stay there to accumulate to buy more block management. It did not stay there for more access. Literally, by the end of the year, if they can't find another rancher that says, yep, I'll go block management this year because you've got cash for me, the money just goes straight back into the operating fund. It is not earmarked. It's not protected. It's not dedicated. And I do not like that at all. Agreed. That verbiage to me was one thing that I highlighted yesterday (coughs) that I thought that looks like it was something that was put in place so is that I don't know why they couldn't just roll that money over and keep it in the same account. That's That was my first thought about it. Why does it have to go back into the general fund? Unless, to your point, it's made to, you know, basically roll that money over and then, you know, artificially deflate the resident fees. And I'd like to talk on that as well when it comes to this block management and gaining access. You know, that's, you know, the money hasn't been necessarily the issue in the past on trying to find block management is trying to find land that they could lease. I know that, you know, they've struggled to find the land. I mean, they haven't expended their budget every single year because they struggle to find ranches to lease. And, you know, the outfitters have claimed, and this is just one of their things, that they're not intending to lease more land. Well, I've had calls from outfitters. I know most of you guys have in here too. It's like, hey, do you know of any ranches to lease in Montana? You know, I'd love to have a place to take guys for elk or guys for deer. I mean, I've taken that call. And and with this and guaranteed tags, they're going to have guaranteed revenue and they're going to be able to lease more land. And again, I understand that. If I was a landowner and I owned 50,000 acres in eastern Montana and I didn't hunt, 
if an outfitter was going to give me $20,000 and I only had to deal with him and his clients or block management where 99% of them are good, 1% are bad, it, it, and you're going to make a little bit of money or a lot of money, I totally get why ranchers are at least outfitters. I mean, I understand that 100%. I hate to see it, but I understand that what the ranchers thinking. But this is going to, I think, in turn, you're going to see less land available. I don't think you're going to see a huge increase in block management. We haven't in the last couple of years. I mean, they're not adding ranches. I mean, I've lived here for 21 years and I get the the layout of all the state every August and there's not a bunch of new ranches every year. It's the same big ranches that have always been there. Yeah. Well, and to your point, Robert, you threw out the number 20,000 bucks for, uh, for a lease from an outfitter. The other thing that's wrong, in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, you probably know more than I do, but I believe there's a $15,000 cap on block management that no one landowner can receive more than 15 k by state statute through block management. That's so, correct. So if I'm an outfitter, I come in, I got to offer fifteen five, and I'm already ahead of the state fish and game for the same exact piece of property, or I offer twenty or 40000 so the yep. fact that our hands are continued to be tied with this arbitrary $15,000 cap number and that it's not being addressed in this bill at the same time, I think is a travesty. The only yep. wiggle room that I saw in there with that $15,000 cap was that that did not come in the form. That was, came in the form of payment, but they were also eligible for any improvements or things like that to the land and access, water project, things like that. sounded like that they could go over and above the 15,000 if they did some land improvement. Let me ask the question is is the general license system broken enough that that all needs to be addressed separately? Cuz the the problem I see as you start guaranteeing licenses that are a general license to specific outfitters. Now this general license is good for multiple units that are designated open general for your giant seasons up there like do we need to break the state out more? What stops an outfitter from shooting you know, 50 elk on his property when the outfitter next door only shoots one? I mean, is this too broad of a stroke to continue the general license program in Montana or not? Well, I'd love to take a stab at that. So and Jared's been here longer than me and Eric has too. But in the 21 years I've been here in Montana, Montana does not manage game. Montana allows private landowners or wilderness areas to manage game. They allow us to hunt for essentially three months straight and on public land with multiple weapons. And, you know, if it wasn't for those sanctuaries of private land in eastern Montana, there would be no elk or deer. If it wasn't for those private land chunks and, you know, just rugged, nasty country in western Montana, there would be no deer and elk. So I, I truly believe Montana does, does not – look at managing them for anything other than opportunity. And they know that with enough private land, they're always going to have enough and we can hunt them for these, you know, long, long seasons. Uh, but I'd love to hear Jared or Eric's take on that, but that's my two cents. Eric, I'm too scared to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would agree with Robert there. I mean, this is a, this is a state that manages almost solely for opportunity and, uh, and like Robert said, those sanctuaries are pretty important in preserving some sort of of population that we can we can hunt. Um, you know, that being said, it, it's gotten to the point now where management is beginning to be a problem in the central and eastern part of the state, um, just because of the overabundance of especially elk numbers over there, um, because so many of them live on private ground. Yeah, without access. Right. And that's where all the shoulder seasons have come in to try and knock knock those numbers back a little bit as well. See what this says to me, and I'm I'm not a Montana expert by any means, but I start looking at other states' programs where instead of this broad statewide stroke of let's give all these outfitters our general licenses and then the non residents are up in arms and it's not fair, like this is turning into a landowner program to me, or it should be, where depending on how much land you have, how much it's utilized by that game, deer or elk, then you are eligible for X number of deer or elk licenses on your land, and that's it. And then the outfitters can guarantee tags for their clients going forward, but it's it's equally weighted, so the bigger outfitters or the bigger pieces of land receive more tags that are in accordance with what the biologist says, 
of what they should have for that area and everywhere else that's smaller gets less. I mean, it's got to be more of a fair system than, hey, here you go, you get 45%. Well, what if the number of outfitters doubles in the next five years? Now they're going to want more. And then it's not fair to the bigger guy. I mean, it doesn't seem like it works in the long term to manage the state as a whole on all general areas. Am I wrong? Well, basically what it looks like to me a little bit is that the the landowners or the guys that the at least the outfitters that operate on private land under that scenario i mean it would almost be similar to what new mexico did with antelope they just said hey if you got private land you know and you're going to hunt it come buy a tag and you can go under that scenario that's great for the guys that operate on private land but for the outfitters that operate on forest service and have forest service permits and places like that they're kind of left hanging. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. you know, left holding the bag for some sense. And there's a lot of guys up there that primarily hunt pri- or hunt public land. So True. I can address that kind of landowner tag issue. Uh, we've had a, a thing in place with um, resident, non, non-resident non sponsored tags. And there's been 2,000 set aside for every year. So back to me owning a 50,000 acre ranch in, in uh, Mile City, I could apply, you know, all you Utah boys under me as a resident and you guys would be guaranteed to draw tags. Um, Well, guaranteed because they've never met their cap as of right now, but you guys would all get tags and you could come and hunt my ranch and you'd have my tag and you can hunt my ranch. You know, you're not eligible to hunt anywhere other than my deeded property. So that has been in place for a long time. Some outfitters have been using that. I talked to, you know, an outfitter last night, not even aware of it. You know, he never even realized he could have been doing that. So that's been in place forever. Now, if you're a non-resident landowner, you can't access any of those tags. But if you're a resident landowner, you could. So that was how people got away with getting guaranteed deer tags for their friends, family, or buddies to come and hunt their land in Montana. Again, non-resident landowners weren't able to, but for elk, there was nothing. Elk, you had to go through the draw, just like we've been talking about. So is this bill mainly being pushed by the public land outfitters that cannot secure enough general licenses for their clients? Who would you say is most behind this? I, I would say these guys, uh, I hate to say this, but I think a lot of the outfitters don't understand the the draw system. Like a lot of these guys were putting in guys and not drawing half and not even realizing, oh, I could have bought a point for my clients. Like they had no concept on how this draw worked. So they were failing. You know, we know a lot of outfitters and work with them that understood how the system worked. And if you went in with one point, however many points, it's always been guaranteed. So they'd have one guy sit out, apply with a big group and draw them all out. So outfitters that knew what they were doing were getting their tags and not having issues. It was the other outfitters that did not understand the draw. Those are the guys that weren't drawing half their clients because they just did not understand how the draw actually worked. Interesting. Well, which is Montana, so most of America <laughs> doesn't understand how it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true. Go back, let's fix the draw first, and then let's address some of these other issues. Um, you know, I, I, I touched on it earlier, but I think the, the main reason that I'm and, – and just for some context, I actually voted against I-161. I was a Montana resident 10 years ago when that went through, 11 years ago. I voted against it. <clears throat> And yet I'm also against 143, which seems like a contradiction at face value. The reason I voted against 161 is because I do feel like game and fish commissions should make most of the decisions about how we manage our wildlife, not necessarily just public sentiment that gets all worked up because public sentiment can kill trapping and lion hunting and bear hunting and whatever else overnight. So I'm not a big fan of managing wildlife by public emotional support. Now, with 143, the reason I'm against it more than anything else, and again, I'm very pro-outfitter. Some of my dearest friends in Montana are outfitters, is because I believe that if we're a cap, you know, if we do believe in free markets, that supply and demand and competition and price are all set through supply and demand curves. And the minute you come in with a tariff, a tax, a quota, a subsidy, call it whatever you want. You shift the supply and demand curve and you don't let the market make smart decisions. And what I like about the market making smart decisions is that it favors good outfitters. If you have a good reputation and you treat your clients well and you perform well, you will book clients. We have competing states like Nevada, Utah, Arizona, others that essentially 
are completely random. I mean, granted, there's some landowner tags, very limited in Nevada, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we have wildly successful outfitters that are outfitting in these totally random states that don't have any guarantee, and they do a great job. But that's because the market is dictating who, who survives and who doesn't. They need to market themselves well. That's a, that's a business asset. They need to produce well. These are all business acumen tests. And if you start putting quotas in place, tariffs, taxes, et cetera, you don't let the market weed out poor outfitters and give new outfitters an opportunity to come in. You, you know, it just I believe in the free market system for creating business opportunity. I don't believe in subsidies for gas stations or restaurants or outfits, honestly. Jared Lyle for president. Twenty twenty four. So I agree with you, Jared, 100 percent. And like it just kills me that just because, you know, a uh, and like there was a hundred outfitters that have went out of business for whatever reasons, you know, since, um, you know, 10 years ago when they lost their tags. And it's just because if you go and buy an outfit, you shouldn't be guaranteed a ton of tags. I mean, that's, that's kind of my thing. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And again, talking to a bunch of outfitters since this bill's been going, all the really good outfitters are not having issues. They're like, yeah, if it, if it passes, it's awesome. If it doesn't, it's fine. I'm going to be fine. You know, yeah. I, I'm booked out far enough. I know how to work the system. You know, I'm drawing tags. So like you said, the best guys are going to continue to do well. You know, this is, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I feel that I, I honestly, and again, I'm against the bill because I'm a non-resident in other states. And then just, you know, I'm against it for the non-resident do-it-yourselfers. I mean, Montana is a great state to come and hunt and to lose a giant percentage of that. Um, you know, when we're losing opportunity in every state, look what Idaho did, look what Oregon's doing. You know, I hate to see Montana jump on that bandwagon. I mean, it may could, it could come to a point, you know, four or five years from now where it's hard to find a, a tag just to go hunting. You know, our, our August and July sections opportunity that Garth Jensen created will be gone. There will be nothing left there. Right. Can we jump over to New Mexico a little bit? I think this is a connection between the Senate bill that's come up in New Mexico, and it's been often termed the outfitter welfare system. And for better or for worse, that term is not doesn't sound the greatest, but what you're talking about in Montana is the good outfitters, you know, they're they're doing okay and they will survive this because they do well. And we've got the same issue perhaps in New Mexico. And that's where there's a, a Senate bill 312 that's been introduced and it's at the committee. And it basically abolishes the outfitter allocated draw for New Mexico. So right now you've got 84% of the licenses being guaranteed to residents, 10% of the licenses for the outfitter draw and 6% for a non-resident who applies on his own without an outfitter. And so what, this has been brought up, obviously, by residents who want more than 84%. Mm -hmm. So this would increase them to 90%, and then non-residents would be left with 10 They say it simplifies the draw. It creates more fair playing field for outfitters because they've got to book whoever they want on their own. They don't have the ability to apply for any hunt anywhere in the state stamp all their clients applications and get better draws for their clients so that i don't know how much merit this one has or how far it's going to make it but that is the bill that's uh new mexico residents are fighting for and they're they're kind of dividing the outfitters from themselves because it looks good for the residents you get more percentage and for a non-resident applying on his own we go from six percent up to ten so it looks good to us but the outfitters are getting hosed in it. And that's the sentiments that are coming out of New Mexico. Well, and at the end of the day, I really do think that what they are doing, I mean, in essence, is taking away some non-resident tax. The reason I say that is because there's no resident that's going to put in for a 10%. They've always said that in the past. Oh, well, residents can put in for the outfitter draw too. Why would you put in for a 10% of the tags versus 84% of them? That right. makes no sense. So... They can choose to go with an outfitter, but none of them are participating in that draw. So instead of 16% of the tags going to non-resident, now there's only going to be 10. Yes, yep. it might be a little bit better drawed, but I think once you lump all of those guys or all the outfitted 
people that wanted to go with an outfitter into that 10% with the 6%, you're moving all them into the same group. So in essence, you're going to get worse draw odds across the board. I don't think you're going to get better. From a non-resident perspective, yes, for 100%. sure. Yes, 100%. Yep. No, and I, it's it's going to be an interesting one. Obviously, this was brought up by a, a Democratic senator there in New Mexico. He A big part of the bill is changing the name of Game and Fish to New Mexico's Wildlife Conservation. Take that for what it's worth. Fish and game was too long. I don't know. He doesn't <laughs> like fish, maybe? I don't know. Maybe. Game. It's not a game. <laughs> so, interesting bill, but definitely keep your eye on that. There'll be... Uh, We'll see how far that makes it or if they change some of the language. Obviously, the outfitters there uh, do not like it. Yeah. Um, But the outfitter program, in my opinion, has gotten a little out of control where anybody can become an outfitter relatively easily, especially New Mexico residents, and apply an unlimited amount of clients, pseudo clients, two-day clients, whatever they want in the draw to try to take tags from other outfitters. Go back to what Jared said. Clean the draw up you have yep. first, mm-hmm. and if there's anything else that needs to be addressed, then address that. Well, a big part of what they're saying is, hey, a lot of the states around us are a 90-10 split. You know, why, sure. why can't we be a 90-10 split as well? Well, it would simplify their draw. I'm not going to lie about that. It does make things easier to figure out, but is it better? Eh, who knows? What do you guys think? I hate to see, you know, non-residents lose – any tags at all if it's in the guided pool or the other pool um you know i just see this you know dominoing you know a lot of states are at a 90 10 new mexico goes there wyoming's talked about it a few times if wyoming goes down that route i mean there would never be another random moose or cheap tag again so and i know that bill's been ran before it's not being ran this year but i don't know i i just hate seeing non-resident opportunity being lost um you know 16 percent is awesome if it goes down to 10 at least it's on par it's not oregon with two and a half so i mean uh, like i said i i'd i'd hope it doesn't go through because i'd like to stay at 16 but 10 i think is you know pretty standard fair across the west I mean, yeah and i think probably a lot of our listeners in the western states you know, if you're so I've I've been an Idaho resident, a Montana resident and a Utah resident now. Right. And so I know what it's like to live in those resident shoes. And, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, I love having 90 percent to me and only 10 percent somewhere else. Or I would like to even have 95 percent for residents and only 5 percent for non-residents. But I think what we forget all too often is two things. One. The majority of revenue is generated from non-resident license sales. I believe in Montana, it's 72 percent right now. Um Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think it's like 72% of licenses sale income comes from non-residents. So we can't ignore the fact that that keeps your resident licenses artificially deflated, and rightfully so. That's great. You can have a cheap hunting license if you live in Idaho or New Mexico or wherever else, while the non-residents are footing the majority of of, of the bill that covers the wildlife positions and initiatives in the state. And then the second thing is, is don't forget that Honestly, if you get too conservative with that, you're going to flood your own state with people moving in. If COVID showed us anything recently, (laughs) it's the number of people moving into these states. You know, your quote unquote home state is is going to overwhelm you if they can't come and recreate in some way, shape or form in a meaningful way, too. So um, I think it's just important to Robert's point. I hate seeing non-resident opportunity get cut, not because of my own selfish desires, but because there's people in that have grown up and that make our nation function from a taxation and an economy point of view that live in Louisiana as well as that live in Idaho. And to the extent that we can let those people have recreation opportunities, bring their dollars into those states and experience what I consider to be the public trust wildlife, I think is a good thing. So I'm not a fan of seeing numbers get cut. I think that's good. I watched the Nevada commission meeting just recently and it was interesting. Uh, Director Rob had a big presentation on dollars coming in, applications, and how much really came from non-residents. And, you know, kudos to them for recognizing that and realizing that they need to keep non-residents interested. They need the dollars. They need the funding. They need the interest. And that keeps the outfitters happy, the economy happy, gas stations, hotels, and everything else. So don't don't cut it off just because 
you think you deserve to have an elk tag every year in your home state and you want your odds to be a little better because there's more hunters being added every year. We're growing in numbers. The odds are just going to get worse no matter what percentage you throw at it. Yeah, I mean, best case scenario, this bill says, hey, 16% of the tags are now available to all non-residents and 84 to residents. But the residents don't. I mean, it's not going to solve anything for that center to bring that in. So if that was the bill, I'm sure everyone in this on this call would be all for it. But, yeah, at the end, it's like, well, you hate to cut non-resident tags. Yeah, I know. Yep. I think we've uh, shared a pretty good synopsis of our feelings and problems with each of them. And hopefully you guys can get out, contact your representatives if you live in these two states or if you know someone that does, or you can contact them as a non-resident as well.